President-elect Joe Biden has pledged to unify a divided nation after the Electoral College confirmed his election victory. Mr. Biden said he would be a president for all Americans and that he would work hard for those who voted for him, as well as those who didn't. Meanwhile, the president-elect's future cabinet is starting to take shape. So far, he's announced more than a dozen nominees for key positions in his administration ahead of his inauguration. For more now, I am joined by Joe Grogan. He is the former director of the White House Domestic Policy Council and a former member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. He's also a fellow at uh, University of Southern California's Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. Joe, thanks for joining us. Do you think that the president-elect was successful in reaching any Trump voters with his message this week? Not yet. I think he, he gets one of those speeches to get it off his chest. He was clearly uh, angry and frustrated with the way that the president has conducted himself in the days after the election and with some of these lawsuits that came across loud and clear. But, uh, you know, even some of the left-leaning press saw that speech as, quote, unquote, scathing or blistering. He didn't really reach out to the tens of millions of Americans who voted for Trump. And he didn't acknowledge the fact that the country is uh, pretty closely divided. Uh, he'll have to, as he moves forward, and I assume he will try to do this in his inaugural address, be somewhat more gracious and reach across the aisle uh, and, and strike a more hopeful, uh, unifying tone. Well, the president-elect has announced several picks for key cabinet positions, including Janet Yellen for Treasury Secretary, Antony Blinken for Secretary of State, and Pete Buttigieg for Transportation Secretary. Joe, what do you make of his choices so far? Well, it's going to be a, a crowded West Wing. They're populating the, the Biden White House with heavy hitters, certainly, big personalities who have been around the block before and will we'll know a lot of the career staff in various agencies and know how the White House and various departments work. It's going to be difficult, say, for Susan Rice, who doesn't have a lot of domestic policy experience, to stay in her lane, quote unquote, and not go into the lane of Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, or Anthony Blinken, or who, who's going to be running state, I assume or even the ambassador to the U.N., where Susan Rice served before. I didn't work at, at you know, state or uh, the U.N., and I wasn't in the national security apparatus, but I got calls from people at all three of those locations, from career staff and politicals asking for help on certain issues. And it's a difficult situation to navigate when you're trying to have a collaborative environment, work with big personalities, and seek consensus. Susan, for instance, uh, she has experience running a policy process, so if she's open and transparent, she'll get buy-in. But if she's wandering too much into other uh, principles' lanes, I imagine there'll be pushback. Uh, but it is, it's a ch management challenge for Ron Klain, the chief of staff, and for Joe Biden, and we'll see how it, how it plays out. I will predict this, though. The announced team so far will not be the team as of June 1, 2021. Some of these nominees may not make it over the finish line for a confirmation from the Senate, but others may find that uh, their elbows are not quite as sharp as other personalities in the White House, and they need to find something else to do or, or move out to an agency or uh, some other department. So I want to I want to follow up with you on that. Um, obviously, uh, there's been some speculation that uh, that Susan Rice has been tapped for uh, the head of the White House Domestic Policy Council. As I mentioned, you previously held that position specifically because it doesn't require Senate confirmation. So you are speculating, Joe, that some of these these uh, nominees are not going to get Senate approval. I assume I assume uh, the undercurrent to that is that you believe that uh, in the Georgia Senate race, that Republicans will, in fact, prevail and that uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell will, will retain control of the Senate. Uh, if, if all of that is, in fact, true, who do you think um, isn't going to, to make it across uh, the finish line to Senate confirmation? Well, even if the Democrats win both those seats in Georgia, uh, and they may, let's be honest, I still think it's a very narrow path 
for some of these nominees to get confirmed. But let's go with the assumption that Republicans win at least one of the seats and retain control of the Senate. I think that Becerra, the nominee for uh, Health and Human Services, he's not a consensus pick. I mean, he, he sued the Little Sisters of the Poor. He sued uh, the Trump administration more than any other attorney general. He took over the Hispanic caucus, and they were bipartisan when he took it over, and they, all the Republicans left under his leadership. So, And he doesn't have a lot of health care experience. So that's a nominee that could uh, take some wax. Neera Tandon at the uh, Office of Management and Budget is not a poli is not a excuse me not a budget uh, analyst. She's not a number cruncher. She's really a policy wonk, and she has made very um, critical comments about uh, Senator Sanders, Bernie Sanders from Vermont, and she has to go through his committee, the Budget Committee, to, before she can make it to the Senate and get confirmed. Those are three that are I think could be uh, targets. I think you know Lloyd Austin the, the nominee for Department of Defense. He needs a waiver. Uh, and there are some Democrats that say that he shouldn't get that. He needs a waiver because he had served in the military within the statutory time frame. They gave one to right. Mattis when he was nominated. And I think a lot of people regret that. So I do think there's some people that are on, on the bubble here. And then there are other nominees that we haven't seen yet that I think Joe Biden is probably holding on to see how these Senate races turn out in Georgia. So, Joe, I want to shift uh, gears a little bit and talk about um, a little bit more about the administration that you served under, President Trump's. Uh, in that capacity, among other hats that you wore, you were also a member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Vaccinations have now begun. Our country is grateful that that is, that that is taking place now. But COVID-19 cases across the U.S. are spiking. We are hearing from hospitals and frontline workers that say that they simply cannot keep keep up with the number of new infections, with the hospitalization rate, with the death rate. Um, do you think that, that the coronavirus task force under uh, President Trump has done enough? And how do you think that the Biden administration is going to be able to move forward to address this health crisis? Well, I left the White House in May of, of this year, and a lot transpired since I, I left. There is no question that we are in a tough spot as a country. We have a terrible flashing red lights on every indicator for COVID. And the only optimistic sign we're getting right now is to see the deployment of the vaccine and more people getting getting the vaccine, which the first dose, whether it's the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, will provide some level of protection. It is true that Joe, Joe Biden's task force has a big job ahead of them, and I'm very worried about the transition between one team and another. Any transition, whether it's in sports or in a company or in a government, is always fraught with peril. And what I think the American people should be gratified by is Many members of the Trump COVID task force have been communicating with the Biden task force for some time now. They've known each other professionally in, in many instances for decades. And there is a free flow of information between the two task forces as they, as they try and figure out a path forward. I'm gratified that the vice president will be getting vaccinated on stage tomorrow uh, on television with the Surgeon General. I think that should be an encouraging sign for every American and break down any resistance to people thinking that the vaccine isn't safe and effective because there were too many attacks on the vaccine approval process during the political season. And it's time for us to turn the page and put confidence in the scientists at uh, FDA to approve this vaccine. Joe, I appreciate uh, I appreciate what you're saying about that, and I and I also think um, that a lot of people are looking to see um, how this transition takes place, as as you're mentioning. And given that you left the Trump administration back in May, it, it perhaps gives you greater ability to talk about something uh, that is at the forefront of Americans' minds right now. There's little bit more than a month left uh, in the Trump presidency, and Mr. Trump has still not accepted the results of the election. 
election and continues to allege widespread voter fraud, which we know is false. Uh, Joe, at what point um, will the president and members of the Republican Party say enough is enough for the sake of the country? We need to put this behind us and unite behind the president of the United States, not because he's a Democrat, but because he is the president. It's a great uh, point. I mean, he was, Joe Biden did win the election, the electors have voted, and he needs to be respected in that role. Uh, Donald Trump also deserved the same respect four years ago, and I don't know that Hillary Clinton has ever admitted that he won that election. Uh, he was attacked in many ways, and I think that's one of the reasons why he harbors resentment from that election, that he was not uh, congratulated in the way that, that he should have been for winning that election fair and square. I mean, there were people talking about Russia. But it is time for the president, in my estimation, to think about the next four years, the next eight years, the rest of his life, and the role he wants to play as an American contributing to the American political process. He has a lot to contribute. Uh, it's up to him whether he figures out what uh, he's going to do with his time. But I think that if he were, uh, if he were gracious and ad admitted that if the electors have voted. Joe Biden will be president, and uh, he he did win a uh, he did win the election. That the president could have a bigger role than if he leaves and uh, refuses to accept that he was defeated. But he will leave on January 21. I I don't have any doubt about that. He he will uh, go back to the private sector, and there were a lot of concerns that he would try and stay. That's that's not going to happen. But it is time for the American people to turn the page and for Republicans to think about the future. I don't think that Democrats have been served well in the past by making excuses when they lost and saying that elections had been had been stolen from them, whether it was the George W. Bush uh, uh, election over Al Gore in 2000, when Democrats said that Bush had stolen that, when it turned out that he got actually more votes and all the media that went down there to audit that election after the fact agreed with that. I don't believe that the narrative that Reagan pulled an October surprise with the Iranians served the Democrats well. I don't believe it serves individuals well to not admit when they lose and figure out how to move forward. And in politics, sometimes you lose. That's rule number one. Now, the Republicans are in a very strong position moving forward. We picked up seats in the House. The Senate, regardless of what happens in Georgia, will be very tight, and I'm hopeful we'll hold on to that. We need to think about why Donald Trump got the second most votes in American history and more votes than any Republican ever, and build on that uh, and, and try and uh, advance the policies that we believe in and strengthen the parties that we're members of. All right, Joe Grogan, thank you for joining us. It is worth noting, though, that Hillary Clinton did give a concession speech to President Trump, uh, President-elect Trump at that point on November 9th, uh, back in that election. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.